In Sri Lanka, there is no constitutional right to privacy uh, explicitly recognized uh, in the constitution itself. You need to have a data usage policy. There needs to be clear guidelines who will have access, what data, where and when, and also how data can be accessed. Who is creating the data? If you're creating the data, you should have the right to decide how you actually want to protect it. Welcome to another episode of uh, our interview series, Shared Values, partnering with a reshaped Europe. Uh, and today we are examining a very important topic, which is the creation of a culture of data privacy. So I have three eminent personalities to discuss uh, this topic with me, and I'm truly delighted we were able to assemble this uh, this amazing uh, interview series. Uh, particular thanks to, to our partners, uh, Economy Next and the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. We've been doing this, uh, now this is our second year. Uh, last year uh, was about Resa 21, coming out of COVID, and this year it's about partnering with one of the most uh, prominent regions of the world, the EU. Uh, let me first introduce my panelists. Uh, some of them are very old friends, um, and others are uh, much more uh, newer entrants into the industry. So, um, Sandhani Vikram Singh is a legal consultant um, in, in information privacy and technology law. I think Sandhani was on the panel um, uh, of experts that drafted Sri Lanka's Data Protection Act. Um, I noticed that her career uh, started off uh, has, has had a varied career in, in the public service with the Attorney General's Department and also um, with a Telco uh, before she went on her own. Um, I also have Chandra De Silva, very famous figure in Sri Lanka, um, the CEO of Lanka Clear, um, which manages uh, Lanka Pay, the National Payment Gateway Network, and also Lanka Sign, which is a, the digital uh, certification uh, body as well. My old friend, Sujit Tristri, uh, he is the president of IASC Squared, um, which is a cybersecurity uh, professional body, and he chairs uh, the Colombo cha chapter as well. There's a whole lot of other positions that we cannot disclose um, for, for uh, information security reasons. Welcome to all three of you. Thank you. And, and, and thank you for, for coming, and I, we really appreciate your time. I'm going to start with you, um, Sandhuni. Um, look, uh, I think we've been working on the, this act for a long time. I remember talk, working with Jayantha um, at ICTA almost, I think, eight to 10 years now. We've been pushing for this, right? But particularly from the IT BPM industry, we want to position Sri Lanka as, as a responsible location uh, to do business in. Um, now we have the act. Um, how will it uh, you know, help us to create a culture of data privacy? So when you look at the act, you need to understand the context it came into operation because in Sri Lanka, there is no constitutional right to privacy uh, explicitly recognized uh, in the constitution itself. And in addition to that, there is no body of law uh, developed by courts in Sri Lanka, which recognize a very detailed right to privacy, which you might find in other jurisdictions. So in, in, in that background, you see the government as well as the private sector in this rapid uh, pace towards digitization and you know collecting data and processing personal data without that kind of um, safety net uh, provided by the le uh, legal framework. So in a context where self-regulation kind of fails to address these concerns of individuals, I think the uh, underlining um, intention of the PDPA, uh, the Personal Data Protection Act, was to create this framework of compliance, uh, uh, legal and regulatory compliance, so that it will compel controllers and processors to uh, devise their uh, data processing activities in a way that uh, not only achieve their own ends uh, in terms of you know business uh, aspirations, but also the expectations or information privacy expectations of their customers and public in general. Right. So I think in, in in the absence of you know other kind of safety network currently available, the law intends to provide for that uh, compliance and legal framework so that you know it compels uh, every stakeholder who processes personal data uh, to act in a responsible, transparent, and accountable manner. Right. Thank you. I think I think there is a framework now in place, and I think it might also be like a roadmap. Uh, you know, for people uh, to kind of figure out where they are and where to get to. And I, I'm going to come back to you later in terms of, of the kind of remedies that the Act provides for those whose da data has been, uh, uh, you know, breached. Um, China, I think, you know, now we, the, the substantive topic is creating a culture of data privacy, right? The Act is only one small component of that. Um, I think with when, when you try to change culture, I think one of the best things, the first things you need to do is get commitment from the top management, then filter it down through right throughout the organization. What would be the good strategies in terms of kind of getting the buy-in? Because there is so much of resistance, you know, 
I think it's it's actually a fundamental thing why why there is resistance, especially if you look at the financial markets, because mm-hmm. most of them are governed by what what's called the principles of financial market infrastructure, which talks about disclosure and you know the good good practices and best governance. So which means actually you need to disclose, right? Which means you need to share data. On the other side, there are directives like PSD two mm-hmm. where it says you have to share with third parties. So 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 they are sort of in a rock, between a rock and a hard place. Right. to do that but i think getting the 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 importance of sharing versus protecting i think that is where uh, you need to make them understand make them aware of the benefits of both and why we should be doing that so in doing so i think there are like three aspects that that if we can convince them for example data discovery because most of these guys need to know what data yeah. exists and the importance <laughs> of data that they have right exactly. i mean uh, I don't know whether you remember. There's a particular bank. I don't want to name the name, where uh, some of the critical, important customers' data was leaked to public. Absolutely. I mean, Sri Lanka, right? Absolutely. And 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 that was like no, no, right? Yes. I mean, uh, so so they need to know and they need to understand the importance. The second one is the principles of least privilege. You disclose data based on privilege, not and uh, primarily it's on necessity. as also time based maybe somebody who's more experienced may get access to more data because you trust them more whatever purposes right and the third aspect is actually you need to have a data usage policy which basically talks about you know it needs to be clear guidelines who will have access what data where and when and also how data can be accessed so because if you don't put these things in place whether you have top management buy in people either tend to abuse mm-hmm. when you have access to the data people tend i mean that's a human nature but also in terms of getting them as a habit you need to have good practices right i i think that has to certainly start from the top uh, while giving access to data for better consumer uh, access or consumer experience for example i mean you know uh, uh, but also at the same time how do you safeguard that data getting into either unwanted uh, you know p- people as or i mean just abusing them for whatever thing i mean that that has happened many times so i think the the main thing is to get the buy in you have to get the best of both worlds from them and 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 the main thing is to actually i think if you streamline the process i think we'll have more better control of you know how things are sort of exposed I th- and I think I I can't imagine how a a a banking sector will, you know react if we were to go to open banking <laughs> where the customer has Absolutely. you know the right to take the information anywhere. I think I think there is this sense that they want to, they think the data they have of the customers is is their you know intellectual property while it is actually the customers Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you Absolutely. know spending habits and 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 credit score etc. Very interesting times for Sri Lanka. I hope this this act, act leads to the you know next level of of, of utilization. Um, And and something to you know coming to you, Suchit. I I think I want to um, get a bit more elaboration on a point that that uh, Chana raised, which is I think one of the first things you need to do before you do anything is to know what you have, right? Absolutely. To understand the state of your you know data privacy programs. You know what happens if there is a breach. Um, you know and and how much of data you have. Uh, how much your staff know about this, right? The levels of training they have. Um, so how do we do this gap analysis when you start off? Excellent thought in terms of you know what we should be doing, right? Because if we don't pay attention to that, right? because Sandhani mentioned uh, being accountable, being responsible, and being transparent about what you need to do, right? and then Chana also mentioned about discovering the data. Put these together, we need to be able to say where my data resides. Now, when Chana was talking about data discovery. and we all have papers on our table and i was just thinking pre computing days it was just in a file and that data resided just there and if somebody wanted to take that they had to you know take the whole file and everybody would know that the file has gone missing and with digitization today the same data resides in multiple places so the discovery part for us becomes more challenging uh, because the data is residing in multiple places So, is it residing within the organization, or is it residing outside the organization? For example, an employee might say, "Hey, just in case, if I lose this data, let me take a copy and keep it at home." And I know, during my engagement, consulting engagement, when I talk to the, some of the IT guys, saying, "Where do you keep your backup tapes?" Or oh, I take it home. And, and there's been plenty of examples <laughs> of even in, in the most, uh, you know. 
most developed uh, countries in the world where people uh, you know senior management in banks um, particularly in the information security part have taken you know backups on on pen drives and they've gone to a pub and then the pen drive has fallen off worse in, <laughs> worse in google cloud <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> unbelievable you know so so discovering the data where it resides is one so when the act is very clear in terms of that data needs to be protected our, our framework should be centered around the data what is my data how what is the value of it and how do i protect it and the act also talks about encryption anonymization pseudonymization i won't be getting into those details right so the use of technology has to be looked at and more importantly who is creating the data if you are creating the data you should have the right to decide how you actually want to protect it so if you were to you know do all these things chan also spoke about a policy so for me the policy should be aligned with the act it, it can't be something what you do so so this is two part right you take the act on one side you develop a policy you also need to know what you do your business processes and where the data is residing and who are the users he mentioned about least privilege or least access so all these things have to be put in together so that it can actually help the organization to decide what is it going to have in terms of an impact right so the protection has to be thought through from a data centric perspective rather than just ad hoc fascinating uh, thought to suggest i i i've heard this word protection coming from you know all three of you and i i want to hone in on on one aspect of, of protection uh, in a, in a, in a question for all three of you look uh, i think one of the most least vulnerable uh, sorry one of the most vulnerable parts of the chain really is at the very bottom of those who actually collect our data right um from the humble garment saver who has so much of your personal information right um down to even you know the marketing department some of the largest corporates and i I've, i've been you know on the same panel with with heads of trade chambers who talk so much yeah we need the data protection act you know we need um, you know implementation of that but then the same marketing department of that chamber is sending me multiple emails of you know of the same event and the worst part is i can't unsubscribe from from particular list without being unsubscribed from the whole list of that organization that's one example and i can't see the irony of it and the only conclusion that i have come to is that there is absolutely no education of these stakeholders how do we solve this problem education awareness right so even for you to educate you need to know what you have what are the collection points and how the data is actually collected processed and stored so collection point storage point usage point and then of course we also need to understand how long do you want to keep this data because the act is very clear you need to be very specific what are you collecting it for what are you going to use it for and how long are you going to retain it and the act also says if you're going to do uh, you know scientific research or you know statistical analysis you can retain that data but then we need to apply the principle of least uh, privilege the difficult part while it may seem the easiest thing is to create awareness it sometimes what i have seen most organizations do is have an awareness program tick mark saying mm. okay we've conducted it mm. awareness granted mm. but how do you measure effectiveness of that program now some of the engagements we've been involved right i mean both here in sri lanka and overseas uh, an initiative of this nature typically takes anything around 3 to 5 years oh, okay right i mean while it may seem long that's a fact and if you're a large organization that cultural change will take that long because you it's not just the culture but you've got to change the behavior the thinking pattern as well uh, suddenly you you worked on the on on the you know the act as well so i'm sure you have you all you all have thought out how to do the awareness um, any insights into so uh, just adding to what uh, um she said about you know creating awareness and that sense of uh understanding i think it's important to add to that is that you know like even chana said it should be from top to bottom kind of uh indoctrination so to speak so the organization must have within their shared values you know this notion of privacy you know have this responsibility uh, equal shared responsibility to protect um their customer data because one thing i've noted in certain organization is that you know they won't have any inhibition when you know exploiting their customer data you know okay let's do profiling you know you know we we need to know what the customer is thinking but the moment the employee tries to keep tabs on these 
very employees they get a bit you know uneasy and you know concerned and you're like no 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 they you know the employees trying to uh, uh, in breach my uh, notion of privacy so it should not be the case you know it should you need to look at it from person level as well even in an, any organization for that matter and you need to have that sense of collective responsibility uh, not just from the top management but you know at each level and every division within an organization as well and so the the in terms of making sure the uh, you know the act achieves its targets because currently it's on a grace period so we have about 14 to 36 months okay. for it come into operation that's a long time that's a long time so the data protection authority has to be set up first mm-hmm. and a lot of regulations and rules have to come in uh, to make things more clearer uh, for controllers processes as well as data subjects uh, to understand the nuances of the law so i think a lot would fall on the data prote- future data protection authority as well um, to make sure people understand what the law requires requires and try to help people to see it not just from a compliance point of view but also from you know sustaining consumer trust consumer uh, uh, you know making sure that there's transparency in the activities and so on so not just uh, uh, approach this just from you know ticking boxes or uh, you know okay we are comp- just by saying we are compliant but you know show to the people show to our customers in a way that you know they appreciate that you know these organizations truly value uh, the data i'm providing for them i i think one of the one of the you know um not really benchmarks but one of the better examples that they 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 that gives us hope is what the rti authority and the rti yes. act has done i think their awareness is slowly but surely you know filtering down and i've noticed uh, even even basic organizations uh, government organizations base, you know basic um, levels of of those organizations are now a little bit more you know conscious of the fact that they need everything have is going to be up you know for for scrutiny or, or for disclosure at some point in the future i think hopefully we'll have some hope in that way but chana you've done a lot of work with with so many people you know banks and other financial institutes even even you know young startups i think you all work a lot with and then what are the you know best practices yeah so so i, I think uh, you know coming back from a compliance and regulatory perspective obviously you know that will work I'll, i'll come back to that but i think the primary thing that we need to as i said it has to go from top to bottom first you need to convince them that the importance of data protection i mean first of all right and and, and that the most effective way of doing that is either linked to their personal life yes. or their own role yes. the risk for example <laughs> what if have something like this happens to your family or or you personally right they then they will understand and then they will say okay you now the same thing can be applied to customers right yes. and customers is also humans and yes. you know just like you and me yes. right and 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 if you relate that then they will really understand the importance why they should be doing this rather than just the law says right so so that is one way of certainly making them understand so that they will actually take steps to you know safeguard rather than you know abusing the data they have you know like what most of the some of the retail guys are doing right now but the second part also keeping them engaged especially the top management mm. in terms of you know sort of educating them regularly the reputational damage it can create you know whether it's personally or professionally or organizationally and the financial damage it can also create and also the personal damage to, to, Absolutely. to so Absolutely. so if you create them aware make them aware uh, the, the the some of these aspects then they will understand the value of safeguarding mm. right and 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 i'm i'm not saying you should not be sharing i mean if the customer's consent is there you can share you should share but but the the fact of the matter is sharing is important the same way safeguarding is also important so if they really link to their personal lives and you know personal organizations you know and the reputation and all that then i would think they will buy in absolutely uh, to the importance and they will stick to this rather than the law says and you know that kind of thing so i i think that is better way of really getting them to adopt than to just say the these are the regulations absolutely because i give a classic example uh, when people uh, send cvs uh, they ask me to forward even at very senior management level one of the things that they do is they put a date of birth and i'm like are you crazy you know this is you know number one uh, inf- information for for identity theft and and they said I, i didn't realize that and then they go back and not just for themselves these are senior management person right but they look at it across their organizations so i think awareness when you link it to their own personal thing even at the very highest level it filters down because self interest is what guides us all right <laughs> absolutely now you mentioned about date of birth right now when you call a bank let's say call a call, uh, a uh, call center for what 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 are the pa- parameters they use for exactly. uh, verification date of birth 
mother's maiden name exactly right <laughs> and your address your full name and i see <laughs> and everybody uses the same <laughs> name right and so so i think uh, or sometimes uh, the number which you have registered with them right now that becomes a problem right now today some some systems use these as the primary key absolutely. for registration absolutely right and for example a mobile number today i can be using a prepaid card and the next moment i may not renew it so i may have registered that with someone and so the other person is going to be getting this one so so i get a lot of awareness in terms and, of the transfer and then also to change this it doesn't require much because i know foreign banks what they do is they ask you trick questions right and that keep changing so they have obviously a list uh, that is not difficult to implement it's just a matter of an attitudinal change it doesn't cost anything they will ask you you know uh, whether you have housing loan or whether you have a joint account and if you have the joint account who do you have the joint account with for example right these don't cost anything to implement It's just a matter of mindset change, right? Um, so, this I'm going to come to you. Look, you're a cybersecurity expert, um, and I think uh, it's as you know, the, as as the digital business model evolves, right? We we have come to the conclusion that data is a new oil, and and I think if we are drafting a cybersecurity strategy, I think we need to put data privacy as a very important component of that. So, how do you? uh incorporate that so now we are concerned about breaches and how much you know what access to systems they have but also that you know even if there is a breach you know how much of that data becomes visible to that whoever does that right um, so how do we incorporate this into a cyber security strategy right so so my my advice to all my clients globally what i tell them is don't try try doing this as a separate initiative right mm -hmm. embed it into your dna so you have a cyber security program which probably started several years ago add this to it now what is the delta here we are only looking at the pii data but otherwise your your program is geared to protect the data so you take a data centric approach and then look at who is trying to access that data then you also look at where is the data traveling to and where is the data going to reside at the end of the day and then you build your preventive controls your detective controls and then also have a incident response plan so that you are you're geared to handle that uh in order to make this work you definitely have to have a governance structure now you can't go and you know alter and have a different governance structure just to cater to this it has to gel with your existing hierarchy right from starting from the board to the executive committees and then the senior managers and so on and so forth so this topic should be an agenda item in all the meetings top to bottom right so so there is reporting from the bottom to the top and likewise from top to the bottom and then of course we should also remember the other stakeholders like now going forward we will have to closely work with the uh, authority the data protection authority right and you need to disclose to them what is your impact assessment Right. and then how are you going to you know communicate that information right. so so when that comes in people are definitely going to ask i am going to share this information with an authority how is the authority going to protect this information right, right. so so that question is definitely <laughs> going to come right Very so now the next one which we are also talking about the authority also the act also talks about an impact assessment and also a, about a breach notification do you wait for somebody to tell you that your data is now trading in the dark market or do we have mechanisms which we can actually uh use to detect even before a breach happens mm. now i mean there are lots of statistics lots of surveys which we have, people have done uh, and especially this part of the world it takes about 400 days plus for somebody to detect that somebody has actually even penetrated the network so that means everybody had about 400 days to find this guy sitting in the network So I think the biggest challenge is rather than talking technology we need to look at a framework right and the act also talks about a data protection management program and in that we need to bring in all this the people side of it process side of it and the technology piece of it and it has to be continuously reviewed and of course it has to be audited so that you know the auditors can give assurance to the management saying the program is delivering its desired results and all, both of you also talked about transparency and trust and i think we are talking about digital trust right not necessarily about the data but we are also saying how do we use technology transparently that it provides that confidence right you know if i engage with let's say with uh, china's organization for open to transact or with anyone that the 
the information I provide will be used only for that purpose. So we are in interesting times, I would right. say. <laughs> and I think uh, I'm, I'm going to use um, what you said in terms of a segue to uh, the next question I have for China. Look, privacy is not just about compliance, right? It's also about making sure that how our personal data uh, supports the business objectives, right? And 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 a business has multiple forces, stakeholders that that impact on it. Uh, there's obviously contractual obligation that they have entered into. There's legal obligation that the Act provides. Then there is a custom expectation because customers also want very personalized products and services without really giving as much information that is required to produce that products and services. So how do you balance all of these expectations? Because it's becoming increasingly difficult. Yeah, so so I, I think that the, the fundamental thing that we really need to, if you if you look at it from a sort of organizational perspective, where we collect a lot of uh, PII, uh, you know, from multiple sources, right? I think I think the fundamental thing is the organization, the people need to understand the importance of that data. Right? Right. I mean, you know, yeah. If you don't understand, of you know, course. you know, what is personal and what 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 cannot be shared, you know, at, at, you know, or, or rest, put restrictions, so that that that. Is a uh, basic thing, right? And but the second one is also the organization need to understand the owner of that data is the person, not of the course. organization. Of right? course. If you don't realize that, then you can share anybody's data with anybody, which which is which is not 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 the right thing, right? So the, the owner of the data is the person. So exactly. That yeah, has to that be is an expectation that, nobody understands. That, that has to be established. I mean, uh, I think I think at a ground level, right? And the third one is also for the purpose that data was collected for. There is a specific purpose. You can't share it with anybody. Just you, you get the NIC for some particular purpose. You can't share it for hundred different. I mean, just yes. like you said, the marketing material that we Absolutely. get every day with all our email. <laughs> Somebody email. has collected our email address. This is a personal, you know, personal email address. Uh, you know, and 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 and, and, and they are using you. it. Yeah, they are giving it to either you know email marketers or whoever, and you know, basically using spam. So so I, I, that that is where I think it can only be used. So that is where I think the the act comes into you know sort of describes you know what can be used for and all these things and and they really need to understand because i think for those if they abuse these kind of thing then the then the law must take take over and you know take you know precautionary actions and also take you know you know penalties uh, whatever that, that the organization because obviously you can't okay you, you you can do from a personal and you know awareness creation and all that but at some point if somebody is really abusing knowing that i mean we know some of the social media organization how they use data for international elections and so Absolutely. on right i mean you know and I don't even know whether anybody went to jail for that. I also, right? <laughs> Probably not, right? I, I think there's a <laughs> trial coming up about Cambridge Analytica and I, both uh, Mark Zuckerberg and, and uh, Sheryl Sandberg are supposed to give yeah, evidence. I mean, so that's the very <laughs> first time I think they have, you know. Yeah, and, and how long it has taken, right? I mean, so, so and, and people who got affected are affected anyway, right? So, so I elections think, have been swapped. Absolutely, right? So, I mean, it, it can happen anywhere and it have, has happened in many places. So, I think the... the if you can safeguard that the data that was collected, first of all, you have the person's consent to share mm -hmm. and for a specific purpose and only use it for that purpose. I think if you can be within that framework, I think we can. everybody can be within the you know, Data Protection Act. I just want to add one thing to it, right? Uh, he mentioned about ownership, right? So while we have a data owner, we also have a custodian. Now, traditionally, what people think, the custodians are IT people and they are answerable for everything. IT doesn't run business. So the data owner has to clearly yeah. determine who and how the data will be used. And the IT's responsibility will be to make the data available when it is needed. And I, I think also, I mean, with, with our busy lives, nobody really has an opportunity to, you know, read all of these emails. So why bother spamming them, you know? <laughs> I mean, business objectives that I, I were talking about is not achieved by simply spamming people. Um, I want to come to you, Sadhguru, because I think one of the main reasons why we got the act was to also give redress to people who've been affected by, you know, their data being used, um, in, not in the way it, it was collected for, right, intended. What are the, you know, uh, recourses uh, under the law that an individual or even a corporate can get uh, in the event that their data is breached? So in terms of individual redress, so if you look at the PDPA, for example, although it's currently not fully enforced, mm -hmm. it speaks about how a data subject uh, who is aggrieved by the actions of a controller or a processor can make a claim directly to the Data Protection Authority, who can um, initiate an investigation, uh, you know, look into facts, call uh, the controller or the processor to, for explanation and make a determination. And in doing so, he can, the, the authority can make either a directive or 
uh, determine the kind of compensation that should be or that ought to be paid to the data subject who is aggrieved uh, by the actions of a controller processor. So the next step is essentially where uh, if the controller refuses or fails to uh, abide by the directive or pay the compensation, then there's a next step where the authority can issue penalties, which can go up to 10 million rupees uh, in in, uh, in certain contexts. So, uh, but, but there is no criminal uh, liability no, as, as of now, right? As of, so the act is just, it's an administrative penalty. So you, if... Again, if they fail to pay that, then the authority can go before the magistrate courts just to enforce the penalty, but it's not a criminal sanction at all. But then there is personal liability as well for every directors or whoever was involved in that action. But the important thing to impress here is that the compensation is not capped. Oh, okay. So the authority can actually um, determine, you know, if a class, uh, if an individual or a class of persons have suffered a certain quantifiable loss, you know, this um, compensation has to be paid to them. This is, would be in addition to a, a subsequent penalty, if at all. And in addition to that, there are other certain recourses in, in available in the uh, existing laws, like uh, under the you, you could take the criminal uh, uh, action under the uh, Computer Crimes Act or the Penal Code, uh, where you can uh, you know pursue a, you know if it, it considers offence against the state, or then there is the civil law actions where you try to establish a wrongful act where you right. have uh, there's a quantifiable damages but it's a longer process and it's all often something that take place you know after the act has occurred but the pdpa is more preemptive in nature in a, in a way so but again it also provides for data subjects to seek redress mm. in the event mm. uh, there is a data breach identity theft or any other uh, action or mission taken by the controller or processor which has uh, resulted in a loss or damage uh, to them right but, but i think what, what is happening is again going back to the uh, rti right um, i think quite a lot of people are aware of their rights and now progressively exercising those rights so initially i don't think there's going to be massive um, you know uh, penalties or, or legal action but as people become aware of of their rights i think there will be a quick follow up question is is our legal system the general you know lawyers and and the legal system um, equipped enough to sort of handle you know lots of um, uh, individuals going to the system or is this the handful of lawyers aware of, of, of the act and, and how to do that because um, I think that, that's a critical aspect of, yeah, of justice going to the yeah. general public. Yeah, yeah well, it's a very interesting question because the, the law is now in itself mm. and um, I think it's growing. There's a growing fraternity in, uh, you know, privacy lawyers in the country. I think that's a good trend. And lawyers more and more are aware of it and they want to, you know, because this is a new, it creates a whole set of new rights. And um, I wouldn't say it's, you know, it, it has hit a, ta- a particular target right now. But I think by the time the act is fully enforced, which is, you know, hopefully in the next three years, okay. I think there would be a, a, a reasonable uh, level of competence and knowledge among the legal fraternity in um, litigating uh, aspects of the law. And the judiciary? Uh, well, certainly, certainly, because there are, as, as far as I'm aware, there are trainings and things going on, um, particularly interest of the judiciary. And I think um, the Data Protection Authority, once established, is something this they, they can, uh, can certainly look into. And hopefully, in the long run, this is my personal wish, that, you know, one day the courts will recognize the right to privacy. Amazing. That would be uh, an amazing the, day for the country. Oh, yes. And uh, in the absence, you know, there's, unless there's a new constitution which recognizes uh, this particular right. But, um, yeah. I, th- I think uh, we are on the uh, positive path, so to speak. Exactly, because I remember the, the, the I think commercial high court is the one that recognized um, uh, emails as, 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 as legal documents overnight, you know, and, and if parliament, we were to wait for parliament, that would have been forever. Yes, to the I just want to add, right, I mean, while you spoke about the judiciary, the legal fraternity, the act also talks about a data protection officer, right? So, so we can't wait till the act get enforced to develop these resources, right? And all of us know the time we have taken to even develop security resources in the country. Right? There's a huge scarcity and you know none of them are going to stay here. And so they'll continue to migrate. And the same will happen to that uh, special uh, skill as well, right? Data protection officers. So here we are talking about not only the private sector, we are also equally have to pay attention to the government sector as well, right? So how do we, you know, uh, equip them with the right knowledge, right skills, so that they'll be able to exercise the role of even not only the data protection officer, even as a controller or processor. So those challenges for me 
a huge and i think you would also have something to say on that yeah i mean i mean so so in terms of resourcing i i think is always a problem anyway right you mm-hmm. never have resources <laughs> that you need you know all the resources so 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 the only way is to build new new skills and you know uh, this thing so i think it's it's a continuous process and and you know if we if we can't stop just because people leave you can the country can't collapse right I mean, no. you know, and i think we need to have people. a continuous process it, it, we it, need to produce cycle. more so that we draw a balance it's somewhere it's a cycle so and something i generally impress upon young lawyers uh, one of the forums is that you know there's a notion that privacy is dead in this digital day and age so to speak but i there's this saying that privacy is not dead but privacy is hiring exactly so there's a global <laughs> demand for Absolutely. this for this area and Absolutely. i think the demand in sri lanka is also rapidly growing and that's a area i think young lawyers uh, professionals can tap into um and you know it'll be uh, i mean it's good for, good for themselves as well as the country and there are global certifications as Absolutely. well right so so people can pursue right i mean maybe i can share those information later on then you can you know publish it because there's a number of them absolutely yeah. quick final question to all uh, all three of you look um technology uh, is a double edged sword and comes to this right it enables us uh, gives us tools to uh, on a very mass scale to kind of look at how we can protect data but as obviously that is also the tool to breach this this privacy how can we get the best out of technology to create a culture of data protection all three of you right so i go first uh, look at your internal controls look at your processes right so that has to be the binding factor today it can be one particular brand tomorrow it can be another brand or that can be a new technology which will get introduced but we need to be very clear in terms of our processes and always look at from your internal control perspective because that's what the board will be more interested are our controls effective are they efficient if there is a weakness or a deviation and that's what the organization will have to focus on to minimize the risk yeah so i, I think in terms of i i look at three areas where technology will i mean creating awareness you know people getting everybody ready for this is is one but i think three areas if we put right for example technology for access control you know it's a must you need, every organization need to have you know as i said principles of least privilege that can be done through technology the second aspect is also prevent somebody from stealing you know anti malware tools mm. to, uh, you know anti phishing kind of tools where people cannot or at least minimize the risk of stealing so you need to put those in place and the third one is also even if somebody steals if the data is encrypted then you can't make use of that data so i think the third thing if you do put those put those three technologies in place we sort of minimize the damages it can be created so i think these are i i, I think sujit might have sujit might have more things but for me i think if you put these three technologies in place we are you know in a, in a very good place i agree with chan that's a quick start right if you do that right everything else will work the act is also very clear they are only talking about these three things at the outset so we need to get that right yeah yeah and adding to that i think uh, one of the approaches uh, that i found very fascinating uh, is that you know using technology to achieve your data protection or privacy goals so we talk about things like pri- uh, privacy enhancing technologies or privacy by design where the principles of privacy or data protection is embedded into the technology design from the inception so these are like initiatives you can think of or you know look at when you are devising your data protection management program or you know you are re- revisiting your data protect, uh, data processing activities i know the act doesn't specifically mention uh, you know data protection by default or data protection by design unlike the gdpr but you know these are things that will help you to really achieve uh, your compliance objectives in a more comprehensive way so you take technology to assist you in that process in that journey um, in a very holistic way so i think these are things corporates public sector or private sector um, could look at about you know how to use technology in a more creative and more holistic way in a way that achieve privacy objectives thank you sandani sujit channa thank you for your time um, i think if this crisis that we are going through has taught us anything is that the sri lanka that emerges on the other side of it has to do business and or live in a completely different way um and i think it's it's good to aspire to be you know a, a world class country because that way you can leapfrog all these you know what we have been going through in the last uh, few decades 
um, and emerge as a stronger country, you know, out of that. I, I know some of our corporates have done all of what we have discussed at a very high level. So why can't the rest of our country?